New U.S. tariffs on billions of dollars worth of Chinese goods are about to hit. How will China respond? And what's the latest on trade talks? Hello, I'm Anand Naidu, and this is The Heat. The trade dispute between the United States and China takes another turn on Sunday with a major new round of U.S. tariffs. Billions more in Chinese goods will be hit with tariffs on September 1st. This time around, the target is consumer products. U.S. President Donald Trump already plans to further increase import duties on $250 billion worth of Chinese products in October. Meanwhile, China has announced that it will introduce a smaller set of tariffs on U.S. goods. The president, President Trump, has uh, been uh, speaking just outside the White House. Let's listen to what he had to say. We've taken in billions and billions of dollars from those tariffs. And as it's starting to come out, the if you look at Chinese government, China, what they've done with tariffs is very interesting. They've devalued their currency so much, which hurts them ultimately, costs them much more to buy things outside of China. But they've devalued so much, it's a bad situation they put themselves in. And I just saw it came over the wires that 13% of certain companies are going to be leaving China in the not too distant future. That's a big thing. Okay, let's begin with CGTN's White House correspondent, Nathan King. Uh, Nathan, let's start with that uh, statement yeah. you just heard there from uh, President Trump uh, talking about the trade war with China. What did you make of it? Yeah, I was here at the White House when he made those comments. Uh, let's just go through them. Uh, he's just taken off in uh, Air Force One. Um, basically, uh, he seems to have got his facts uh, mixed up. First of all, on the currency ma manipulation, we just had the IMF come out and say that's not happening. In fact, uh, the RMB could actually drift uh, lower because of the trade war. Also on this 13% of businesses leaving China. I think what he's referring to there is a lot of research that's been done by the U.S.-China Business Council and others, basically polling U.S. businesses. And what they said was 87% of U.S. businesses have no plans to move any of their supply chains away from China. So that's where he may have got that 13%. No, it doesn't mean 13% leaving. It means 13% maybe sourcing from other countries as well. And in that same survey, by the way, because I just read this over the last couple of days, 97% of respondents, U.S. companies, said that they were making a profit in China and their margins were very good. So uh, that's kind of uh, where the president was getting his information from. But, of course, he spun it in a different way, Anand. So, Nathan, let's talk about the tariffs, U.S. tariffs. Break it down for us. How extensive are they, and how is China responding? Well, I mean, we've had hundreds of billions of dollars worth of Chinese imports tariff uh, so far, haven't we? Already 250 billion, 25 percent, 30 percent. But this is different. We're having two tranches. The first one happening this weekend on September 1st, about 112 billion dollars worth of Chinese goods going to be uh, tariffed at 25 percent. But these are consumer goods. The previous rounds of tariffs have ra rather been on uh, business inputs. That are things that you and I don't buy, but they go into making the stuff that you and I buy. So what are we talking about? We're talking about shoes, especially, and clothing. In fact, about 97% of all the uh, clothing that comes from China and shoes will be under tariff uh, after this weekend. Also, we're looking at uh, 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 consumer stuff, uh, uh, things we buy, uh, you know, electronics, stuff like that. What is being delayed is about another $160 billion worth of Chinese imports uh, to December 15th. Why is that? Because they're things like iPhones, things like laptops, which te people tend to buy around the busy holiday season. Uh, we've got Black Friday coming up, uh, of course, during the Thanksgiving. Those will escape tariffs until the middle of December. But still, even before that, JP Morgan, for example, has come out and said, you know what, under the current tariff system, it's going to cost about $1,000 per American family, uh, which is quite incredible when you uh, think about just a year ago, he was saying, you know, trade wars are easy to win. Nathan, we're also hearing about talks taking place between the two sides uh, in Washington in September. Uh, what's the latest on that? Well, you'll remember when talks broke down in May here in Washington, there was a big standoff and Trump sort of uh, pushed up. Uh, and then uh, there was a delegation that went to 
Shanghai, not Beijing, but Shanghai, uh, at the end of July. And they came back and said, look, we think we can talk in September. But since then, we've seen more tariffs. Uh, and then President of the G7 last weekend sort of saying, uh, yeah, we're definitely having talks in September. In fact, we've had calls. We found out those calls. Well, we knew those calls hadn't happened because we would have reported them. Uh, and the American media knew that they hadn't happened as well. Uh, and now he's just come out uh, here at the White House before leaving uh, saying there are talks in September. We have no confirmation. Uh, from the Chinese Commerce Department, who, of course, have been taking the lead, or Liu He, the uh, economic uh, uh, chief negotiator, about this happening. Uh, Trump obviously wants these to happen, but is the climate right, considering we're just going to see a big tariff bump uh, over the weekend? We'll have to wait and see. And remember, China, of course, is responding. Uh, it's putting up uh, tariffs on autos, which it had uh, lowered. It stopped buying soybeans. So. The climate for uh, any talks in September, if they do go ahead, uh, is not positive. But we've seen gyrations in the stock market. Trump has warned at the G7 the, about the uh, slowdown in the global economy, a global recession, question mark, the inverted yield curve that Wall Street likes to talk about, which signals sometimes a recession. So all this, of course, is pressuring Trump. And the question is, does he want a deal now uh, before he runs for re-election? Thanks, Nathan. That's CGTN's Nathan King reporting from the White House. OK, there is much to discuss. Let's get to our panel. Joining us from Beijing is Xiao Hai. He is Assistant Research Fellow at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. With me here in the studio is John Setalides. He is a Government Affairs Specialist and Consultant to the US State Department. Joining us from Portland is Yan Liang. She is an Associate Professor of Economics at Willamette University. And also with us in the studio is Saruhan Atipolo. He is the CEO of Business Environment Risk Intelligence, and he's a CGTN Global Economic Analyst. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Zhao Hai, let me start with you in Beijing. You know, during those remarks that President Trump made just a few minutes ago outside the White House, he also said that China wants a trade deal very badly. In fact, he said China needs to make that deal, conveying the impression, yet again, he said this before, that it's China that wants a trade deal more than the United States. Um, Looking at these new tariffs that are, that are going to be imposed on Sunday, the 1st of September, uh, how is that being seen in China? Well, China do wants a deal, but uh, uh, it's not the deal that under Trump's uh, current terms. So I think he's wrong about uh, uh, that. And also from Beijing, I think increasingly we see that President Trump is not intended to maximize benefit for both countries and for Americans. He just want to maximize pain uh, on China and try to push down China's economy. He repeatedly said that he wants to uh, squeeze U.S. companies out, out of China and uh, want them to find an alternative location for their production. And also now he's citing numbers here and there trying to prove that China's economy is going down. So I think he's trying to maximize, maximize pressure on China uh, so that China can surrender to his terms. And so far, China has not uh, uh, given an inch. So I think his strategy is failing uh, as far as uh, at, at this moment. And uh, uh, in the future, it's not, uh, it's not going, to, going to work. And the pressure on him will increase. So from China's standpoint, uh, we want him to be sincere and to be rational in this uh, negotiations uh, and uh, ultimately waiting for the U.S. side to come back to the negoti ta negotiation table with a realistic, pragmatic offer. John, uh, the Chinese have also been talking about reducing tensions. In fact, the Chinese Vice Premier Liu He recently said that there's a need to adopt a calm attitude. And then we heard from the Chinese Ministry of uh, Commerce. This is what their spokesman had to say. Let's watch this. <laughs> China has sufficient countermeasures, but I think both countries need to focus on how to eliminate punitive tariffs and prevent the trade war from escalating. For now, talks between China and the U.S. are underway. I want to reiterate that trade war hurts China as much as it hurts the U.S. and the rest of the world, and might have disastrous consequences. Enterprises from both countries are very much dependent on one another. So that's the Chinese Commerce Ministry spokesman there, John. What is your reading of what's going on? I mean, are these tit-for-tat tariffs just going to continue? They may, uh, and it all depends on the decisions that are being made in Washington and Beijing in the weeks and months ahead, possibly years, Anand. We don't know when this is going to end. And the Chinese government representative is speaking what we would call the more traditional negotiating style, traditional diplomatic style. And as we've recounted, uh, including here in previous episodes and on, that uh, President Trump 
brings a very unorthodox negotiating style, one that he supremely feels confident about given his own success in business that he thinks can apply to diplomacy and to trade talks. Uh, I don't know that pressure is being applied for the sake of pressure. It's not to bring pain to the Chinese economy. It's a tactical strategy, right? You need pressure to get the other side to begin to move closer in your direction. And there is going to be pressure from the Chinese government on the Trump administration as well. They're looking at the 2020 elections. They're looking to see where they can maximize the pain on states that are key to President Trump's electoral strategy. But the larger issue, I think, down the road is what is going to be the defining relationship between the United States and China? Will they be uh, competitors? Will they be collaborators? Will they be enemies? And I think we have to tread very carefully here to make sure that we have a positive outcome for both countries. Yan Liang, what's your uh, take on what's going on here? The talks are scheduled, the next round of talks, that is, scheduled for September in Washington, D.C. Is there any reason to believe that there could be a breakthrough? Um, thank you for having me again. Um, I think, you know, since the uh, talks in Shanghai, President Trump seemed to take a slew of actions that um, greatly escalated the trade tensions. And I think it seems that he is the one who is in a rush to try to get a, uh, a trade deal because I think increasingly he recognized that the easy and quick trade deal is difficult. It's harder and harder um, to win. And actually, he is going to be nervous about it when he gets closer and closer into the 2020 re-election. Um, so that said, I think come September, he would still try to apply maximum pressure, and yet he has to walk the fine line of not crashing the U.S. economy, um, which is, is a, a question here. And for China, um, the October 1st is the 70th anniversary for the founding of PRC. So there could be two likely outcomes. For one is um, they could come to negotiation tables and make some concessions, for example, buying agricultural products in exchange for removing or suspending the tariffs. I think that is what they are asking for consistently. Um, they are uh, sincere about trade talks, but they want um, to remove these tariffs as a punitive measures to um, get a trade deal. The opposite could be um, they will take a tougher stance to showcase that China is not going to succumb to um, the U.S.'s bullyism. And I see both outcomes are quite likely. So, Han, let's look at sentiment here in the United States. We know that public opinion, public sentiment here in the United States is what often drive, drives what politicians say and what politicians do. This new round of tariffs is going to hurt American consumers. These are consumer goods that are going to be directly affected, electronics, computers, things like that. Um, I mean, once American shoppers start feeling that pain, and we, as Nathan pointed out, we are going into a major shopping season in the next few months, is that going to change minds here? I think it will, um, and because if you actually look at the consumer sentiments uh, index that came out very recently, uh, you've seen the largest uh, drop, monthly drop, uh, in seven years. And then you look at that number, it is the lowest in three years. So when we look at this and look at the consumer spending as being the pillar of the economy, economic growth recently, now that's weakening. And at a time like this, introducing new tariffs on, on goods that are directly going to hit consumers is not a great idea because we are already seeing the weakening in sentiments. We are already seeing consumers becoming nervous about this. So in my opinion, what is going to happen is not an escalation come October. It is going to be actually calming down of the rhetoric from the U.S. side because of, uh, again, the upcoming elections and the president realizing that if consumer weakens, economic growth weakens. So I'm actually expecting a better outcome come October uh, as far as the trade talks uh, are concerned. John? Yeah, it's very interesting to see how there is a bipartisan consensus that's formed here in Washington, D.C. We always focus on President Trump, but he's not the only decision maker here. Ultimately, he'll sign off on whatever hopefully can be negotiated. But he has backing of the House uh, Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, and the Senate Minority Leader, Charles Schumer, who are the leading Democrats for a, sort of a sharper edge negotiating approach with China. And I think what also is being communicated here to the American people is, yes, there may be some consumer pain in terms of tariffs on TVs and headphones and iPhones and the like. 
But if the United States doesn't take these actions now with China, it's going to be a far worse situation in three years, in five years, in 10 years. So far, the American people seem to have been given uh, a little bit more leeway to the president on this. If it gets very difficult in the months ahead, that may turn around in 2020. But I think he still have se he has several months of negotiating wiggle room here, and I think he'll take maximum advantage of that. Shah, hi, what do you make of that, that there is bipartisan support here in the United States for the action that President Trump is taking? Uh, yeah, exactly. That's why we're saying uh, no uh, sign from the U.S. side, particularly from the Trump administration, that they're willing to reach a deal. Because uh, on the one hand, if there's, if there's a deal, then that will help Trump to be reelected. But then if there's no deal, fine. He's going to show the people that he's uh, getting tough against China and uh, he's going to have support uh, of uh, both parties in Washington, D.C. So at this moment, um, really, there's no reason for, for the Chinese side to give in uh, or to negotiate a deal and give uh, any concession to this administration uh, because Trump uh, he's continuing from his rhetoric and both uh, from his rhetoric and his deeds uh, showing that he's willing to pressure right. not only Chinese side but also American companies to quit Chinese market and, and Chinese uh, production line right Joe hi and on that point of who makes the first major concession President Trump continues to say that the trade dispute is hurting China more than it's hurting the United States uh, and he often says that while complimenting President Xi Jinping. Uh, this is what President Trump said at the recent G7 meeting in France. Let's listen to this. And I think they're very smart. And I think President Xi is a great leader who happens to be a brilliant man. And he can't lose three million jobs in a very short period of time. And that's going to be magnified many times over. Is President Trump right there that this trade war is having such a big impact on China and China's economy that it's going to force the Chinese to make a deal very quickly? Uh, I don't think so, because um, these are empty words, because he's not uh, matching his words with these. And he's continued to uh, escalate this trade war, uh, not reversing at any point uh, in the future, So, uh, as far as we can see. So I think at this point, uh, even though both Chinese economy and American economy are suffering, uh, and because he continued to believe that China suffers more than the U.S., therefore, he's not giving in and he's not uh, uh, trying to negotiate uh, from a, a different standpoint. Uh, for the Chinese side, too, I think uh, we're thinking, of course, if we reach a deal, then maybe uh, it's going to be worse because he's not committed to the deal. And at any point in the future, he can reverse his decisions and continue to challenge uh, the deal. So uh, we have to uh, make sure that this administration is trustworthy to reach a deal. Okay, John, I'll get to you in a moment. Yang Liang, I just want to get your view on what you've just heard, uh, this back and forth going, taking place between uh, President Trump and China. Um, I think Trump really exaggerated how much pain China has and how rosy the U.S. economy has been. I think if you look at the empirical data for China, despite all the talks about the moving away of the companies, we see, still see the inward FDI in China rose by 3.6 percent uh, this half uh, in the first half of 2019 to reach $79 billion. And China's exports um, uh, increased actually, um, so the total trade surplus also increased by 36 percent on the uh, at the year-on-year -year basis. Right. Um, and China last quarter's growth dipped down to 6.2 percent, which is low for by China standard, but it's still incredibly healthy in the global uh, given the global economic climate. And for the United States, um, the manufacturer has contracted the first time in 10 years. Mm -hmm. Export has slowed down to the to the. Uh, fastest to pay since 2009. Consumer sentiment has gone down since uh, the lowest since 2016. And added to that, you see the small business lending decline, you see the inverted yield curve. So I think all we're seeing here is that the U.S. economy is not as bleak as he would like us to believe, and the U.S. economy is not as rosy as he often claimed. And going back to the bipartisan support, yeah. I think what the bipartisan support is on the principle of taking on China, but not necessarily on President Trump's tactics, which is applying tariffs. There are plenty other strategies like bringing this dispute to WTO, where the U.S. won for the most part anyways, um, and also getting international allies instead of setting up enemies here and there. And finally, if you really believe in the intellectual property rights infringement, well, get the hard evidence and go for the right. legal route. 
The other point, John, is that in many instances, what's happening in reality doesn't square with what the president is telling us uh, about what he wants. I mean, he wants American companies, he says, to pull out of China, come, to come back to the United States. We've just seen one of the biggest American retailers, Costco, open its flagship store in the city of Shanghai. Great deal of enthusiasm for the opening of that store. I think one of the things the president is looking to do is to demonstrate to the Chinese government, to the world, but especially also to American companies and other companies that are looking to continue their business in China, yeah. that he's willing to take this to the extra mile. He's not going to relent anytime soon. And we saw that even with his remarks earlier today. You know, this fight is on and we're going to win. I mean, he's supremely self-confident in that way. And I think the goal there is twofold. One is to persuade companies to really think hard about future investment in China as more supply chains are moving to countries such as Vietnam and elsewhere in Southeast Asia, but also to promote a wedge between the, the commerce ministers, hardliners in Beijing, and the economy ministers, more reformist sentiment, and look to see how the reformers can prevail yeah. and have China come into what Robert Zellick had called once uh, the goal of having China be a responsible stakeholder in the international order. And I think the president's advisors are telling him there is a wedge there to play into. And President Xi maybe hasn't decided which way he's going to go, the commerce minister side right. or the economy minister side. So, Ron, what about the internal pressure that the president is facing? Uh, we had a report from the American Farm Bureau. Farm bankruptcies in the United States are up 15 percent over the same period last year. Uh, and farm exports to China have dropped by 1.3 billion just in the first half of this year. Uh, so farmers and U.S. businesses are pushing back on the tariffs. Does this put the president under even more pressure? Well, of course, it uh, brings some kind of pressure, but you know, there are subsidies, there are different ways of dealing with that to compensate for the losses in the short term. Um, I do agree that there is going to be uh, pressure still on do especially they the long term. Those subsidies it doesn't, but to yeah. a certain extent, it compensates them, yeah. right? And then if you bring in the nationalism part, patriotism part, uh, the farmers and the manufacturers are actually going to take the short term yeah. pain. But one point about the economic growth um, situation, just because the absolute value is higher in China, 6.2 or, or so, yeah. uh, doesn't mean that actually it is doing better. If the U.S. is growing 2 percent, but China goes down to 5.5 to 5.6 percent, Chinese economy would be hurting much more because they need 6 percent and above growth to accommodate for the shift that's taking place in their economy, which is uh, straight to services and consumption. Right. So that's a very important thing to mention. And I will say this, though. The agreement is, in my opinion, going to come sooner than later. It's not going to be the cyclical part of trade, just numbers. The structural issues, which I believe was going well with the forced technology transfer, IPP, uh, Chinese Congress actually was addressing this issue, these issues. I was really optimistic. But that issue, those structural issues, yeah. are so much more difficult right now to handle. But uh, let's not be surprised if there is a trade-only, numbers-only agreement between the two countries before the end of the year. Jaha, do you agree there'll be a trade deal sooner rather than later? Uh, no, I don't think. It, it really depends on the U.S. attitude at this point. And I would add that uh, uh, economic slowdown is not necessarily linked with the result of the negotiations because that really depends on uh, how the terms are offered and how they exchange proposals. Uh, and also on the other side, I think uh, Trump administration and particularly President Trump himself has really great power in foreign trade. And at this point, if really both parties uh, are different, uh, having different opinions on tariff wars, then they would uh, uh, use their power in the Congress trying to restrain uh, uh, President Trump's uh, use of tariff against uh, uh, not only China but other countries. So I think moving forward, the important thing is uh, for the Trump administration to realize that their, this approach uh, to try to negotiate uh, you know, using maximum pressure it's not going to work, and uh, they have to change their uh, uh, way of doing business with China. Right. Yang Liang, there was a report uh, from a Chinese economist working at Deutsche Bank, the very big German bank. He told uh, the United States business network, CNBC, last week that China is preparing for a trade war that could last more than a decade. Is China planning for a long, long, adopting a long-term strategy here in this trade war? Well, we certainly hope not. Um, but I agree the previous, uh, with the previous speaker. The trade war is going to inflict a lot of losses and casualties on both, con 
on both countries. And it is true, if China slows down, this is going to be a great pain for the Chinese people. But on the other hand, uh, President Trump is the one who is facing the election, and economy is his biggest card. It doesn't need to take an economic uh, recession for him to lose his chance. Just a small slowdown in the economy is going to hurt him a lot. So I think in that case, even if China is going to have a more economic pain, it's likely the U.S. is going to be the one that blink first. Um, but I'm really hoping that um, this trade war is not going to last uh, so long and uh, inflict so much unnecessary pay, um, especially when you talk about you know, decoupling. It's not, I mean, it's not impossible, but the question is, you know, at what cost and what is it all for? Um, so, and also for the Chinese structural reform, I think before the trade war, um, it's doubtful whether the reformists will win or the conservatives will uh, win and, and uh, you know, go back to the more state-led uh, economy. But with the trade war, it really doesn't help with the reformists because now the conservatives have this rhetoric that, you know, if we implement any structural reform, this is a yield to the external power, the external pressure. And I don't think this is conducive to any fundamental structural reform in China. John, Yan Liang makes a great point there. Mm -hmm. The president does have a political challenge here, doesn't he? He wants a trade deal before the 2020 election, something he could take to the electorate. He's based his entire election, it seems, his enter entire platform on how well the economy is doing. So if he gets a deal with China, he can take that to the electorate and say, look what I've done. Possibly. And he would prefer a trade deal. Yeah. I don't think it's absolutely necessary. I mean, you know, the, the trade deficit with China uh, makes up a minuscule portion of the overall U.S. economy of $17 trillion. Will there be possible consumer pain? There could be, depending on how long these tariffs last and whether or not they're escalated even more in 2020. Right. Uh, but uh, in American politics, 14 months is an eternity. We have a long way to go here. And again, the president, whether it's part of his negotiating style or he, it's genuine, he is exuding supreme self-confidence here. And I think he's trying to keep the Chinese leadership completely off balance. They can't figure out how to negotiate with this man. And I think he's going to continue with a very confusing, unorthodox style for the foreseeable future. Is that a good strategy, sir? Or well, I, we'll see. I think there is some, some uh, relevance to it, yes, uh, it, because it is working, because uh, the two sides actually are still talking. We don't see them mm -hmm. at the, at the high, high you know, level, but they're still talking. Is and it working? Because we've just had a warning from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce representing U.S. business. It's warning that of a rising risk of a recession if this trade war continues. Well, I don't think uh, to talk about recession, it, first of all, is too early. When, yeah. when uh, you're at full employment almost yeah. and the consumer spending is at the level that it is, I still think it's going to slow down. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about recession is, is, uh, is probably, uh, it's not going to happen. It could be serious, serious slowdown, sure. And maybe at the end of 2020, we could see a recession. Okay. But right now, that is, uh, that is not in the horizon. And we have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for being with us. We're going to have to leave it there. Have a great weekend. Thanks for being with us.